Hello everyone, good evening, buenas noches, como están, feliz viernes. Uh, my name is Ivan Salinas, I'm the programs coordinator here at Beyond Baroque. Uh, I want to welcome you to the Wanda Coleman Theater and tonight's program of translating Latin American poetics. I want to acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Tongva peoples. We recognize the Tongva as the first peoples of this land. We acknowledge the wrong done to indigenous communities through colonialism and genocidal practices. And we are committed to uplifting their communities, stories, and cultures. To share a few words about the space and beyond Baroque, we are a nonprofit literary arts organization founded in 1968 by Church Story Smith. This building used to be the original Venice City Hall building and it operated as such until the late 70s, uh, after which Beyond Baroque poets, artists uh, moved into the space to, for it to become a house for poets and artists for the community of Venice and Los Angeles. We continue our 55-year legacy through extensive programming from readings with emerging and established authors to exhibitions in the Mike Kelly Gallery, as well as craft workshops in poetry and nonfiction. Tomorrow we have a reading celebrating the inaugural Linda J. Albertano Fellowship, won by poet Abby Page. She'll be performing uh, with other uh, cohort of poets, uh, including Brendan Constantine, Laurel Laurel Ann Bogan, and a few more. And later that evening, we have a group reading with Armenian American authors featuring Nancy Agabian, Arthur Kazakian, uh, among a few other poets. Next week, you can also find us at the LA Time Festival of Books. We'll have plenty of um, new books, uh, including authors signings. Um, former <coughs> LA Poet Laureate, Lynn Thompson will be with us. Um, Jose Hernandez Diaz, uh, signing books of, uh, signing copies of his new book, Bad Mexican, Bad American. And we're ending the month with the third edition of the Poetry Film Festival. Tickets are available on our website. And this year we'll be screening the feature length documentary, Life is a Saxophone, a documentary on the life of Watts poet, Kamau Daoud, uh, founder of the World Stage in Lemur Park. And lastly, you can also sign up to our historic Monday night fiction workshop and our Wednesday night poetry workshop happening every week on Zoom for those looking to develop more of their writing. And we have memberships available starting at $60. Uh, you actually get a free tote bag with that, uh, some Beyond Baroque swag and discounts on used books as well as any paid programming in the future, including a program like the festival. Um, we are here thanks to the support of community members like yourself. Um, thank you for being here uh, this evening and our memberships keep our programming free. So please consider supporting the space and in turn supporting the authors like the ones that you'll be hearing from tonight. And just wanna shout out our team that makes this evening possible. Please give a round of applause for Quentin Ring, Jimmy Vega, Michelle, Raphael, Eric Alberg. Thank you all. All right. So, uh, va a ver algo de Spanglish, a bit unapologetic. Uh, I think you all are in for it. So we're gonna hear some translations um, in, in Spanish, some uh, from the Spanish to the English, and we'll be hearing from four amazing poets and a moderator, uh, Anthony Seidman, uh, who will be asking a few questions to the cohort of, of poets that are joining us this evening. Um, but first, we'll hear a few words from Vice President of the Board of Trustees of Beyond Baroque, an amazing poet, friend, Ramon Garcia, who will say a few words about the program tonight. So please give a warm welcome to <laughs> Prof. Ramon. Thank you, Ivan. <clears throat> uh, yes, I'd also like to thank uh, Quentin Ring, the direct director of Beyond Baroque, um, uh, Ivan Salinas, um, the program's coordinator, G 
Jimmy is out there, um, the associate director and uh, Genesis in the bookstore um, for making this uh, possible and supporting me in curating this program. As vice president of the Board of Trustees at Beyond Baroque, I welcome you to tonight's program focused on poetry and translation in Latin America. As a board member, I've been interested in making Latinx poetry, Latin American poets, as well as translation and its practitioners visible in our programming. Translation is sometimes under-considered or under-recognized despite its fundamental contributions to literary production. The United States translates less than, less than any other developed, developed in quotes, country, and there is very little funding for the important work that translators undertake. Uh, also, those of us who are poets really um, value them and really appreciate the work that they do um, because it's important for our own practice. Otherwise, you know, we couldn't read in every language out there except if it weren't for the, the translators who make that possible. Translation of literary work therefore ends up being a labor of love and of service to a language or a community. Translation plays an important role in a poetic tradition or a language development. In the 1960s, a generation of North American poets transformed American poetry through their own reading and incorporating of Spanish language poetry and translation. <clears throat> the translations of Federico García Lorca, César Vallejo, Pablo Neruda, Jorge Luis Borges, Jorge Guillén, and others, mostly almost exclusively uh, male poets, transformed American poetry in the 1960s. Whether, tran whether these translations were good or not is another question. Um, what is clear is that American poetry would not have been what it became if it had not been for the adaptation of the poetry of Latin America to that generation of, um, of, Latin Amer of North American poets, and which very, you know, some of them are still around, but definitely left a legacy in, in my own generation and after. Tonight's program, uh, Translating Latin American Poetics, features poets from various parts of the Americas, including Los Angeles, and presents some of their work in translation or as, an inf or as informed by translation in its various manifestations. After the reading, Anthony Seidman, um, distinguished poet and translator, will join uh, our guests for a discussion about poetry, uh, translation and its uh, many ramifications, as they will be evoked in the poet's reading tonight. Enjoy the program, and thank you for joining us tonight. Okay, first we'll hear from Margarita Pintado Burgos. Just read a very uh, one line or two about, of their bio, but you can read more in this uh, program we printed out for you all. And Margarita is joining us from San Diego. Uh, she also has roots in Puerto Rico, as a poet, literary critic, and scholar. Uh, she is the author of a few books like Ficción de Venado, Una Muchacha Que Se Parece a Mí, and also Simultania, La Marea, uh, Ojo en Celo, I and Heap, and a few more. Um, she co-directs the poetry website, Distropica, and uh, also our author's books are available in the bookstore after the reading. And I'm sure they'll happy to be, um, I'm sure they'll be happy to sign it. All right, please, bienvenida Margarita. Gracias. Thank you so much for uh, the invitation. Thank you for coming. It's Friday night. Uh, I guess poetry, it's what you do on Friday night. Um, yes, I am a Puerto Rican poet. I left the island almost 20 years ago when I was 26 years old, and um, I didn't think I was going to stay in the US, so that was a twist of events. Um, my whole family is still in Puerto Rico, so I'm always, uh, you know, you know how it is. I'm here, but I'm there. And when I'm there, I'm here. Um, I'm going to be reading today from uh, mostly from Ojo en Celo, I in Heat. Um, I write mostly in Spanish. I started writing in English like maybe two, three years ago. 
Um, so I'm going to be reading in Spanish and English, not all of the poems, um, but a few in both languages. Um, the translator is uh, Alejandra Quintana Arrocho. She is a Puerto Rican 22-year-old uh, who found me and wanted to translate my poems, and she turned out to be amazing. She was she just finished a big project translating a Nobel Prize um, writer Gabriela Mistral. Um, so she's just she's just an amazing. Uh, this was this was a daring project I feel because none of us is a native speaker of English. We're both native speakers of Spanish, um, but we came together and um, put this collection um, together. Okay, and I'm gonna start reading Ojo en Celo just because that's the title of um, this book. And I'm going to read, and I think we're all going to do the same thing. I'm going to read in Spanish first and then in English. You can hear me well, right? Yes. Okay, good. Thanks. Ojo en celo. Para el ojo en celo y en brote de sequía, el azul del cielo disgregado en cada grano de arena, flamea en la retina que finge y eyacula sobre la orilla blanca de una página El sueño mojado del poema. Eye in heat. For the eye in heat and on the brink of drought, the blue of the scattered sky in every grain of sand flames in the retina that faints and ejaculates on the wide border of a page, the poem's wet dream. Uh, I'm going to set up my timer, sorry, I forgot. And I know I have 10 minutes, but now I have like nine or eight. <laughs> okay. Bosquejo del llover. El bosque. Decir el bosque. Proponer una música. Tallar la brisa. Ver un paisaje, ver llover, sin lluvia pero con llover, con ese llover que siempre ocurre cuando lenta, suave, tan hecha de minúsculos trozos de un aire que no pesa, me digo que veo llover, me lo repito junto a la ventana, que va a llover, que voy a ver llover. Avanzar la idea de la lluvia antes de que el aguacero siembre todas sus dudas. Lloverse sobre el llover, dejarse llover, ver llover, decir que veo llover hasta que llueva, hasta que lluvia, hasta que, hasta. Raining outlined. The forest. To say the forest. To suggest some music, to carve the breeze, to see a landscape, see it raining, without rain but with raining, with that raining that I always conjure when slowly, softly, filled to the brim with tiny traces of an air that's weightless, I say to myself, I'll see it rain, I say it again beside the window that it's going to rain, that I'm going to see it rain. To put forth the idea of rain before, the downpour plants all its doubts. To pour oneself on the raining, allow oneself to rain, to see raining, to say I see it's raining, until the raining, until the rain, until then, until. Uh, la contorsionista, the contorsionist. I wrote this. I lived in Arkansas for five years um, in a tiny town called Arkadelfia. It has 10,000 people. Nothing happened in, in Arkadelfia. Um, I went to Walmart to have fun, and I did have fun. Um, this circus came to town, and it was a big event. Arkadelfia, it's, a, it's like the 50s there still. 
Um, and when this circus came to town, it was way more tangible that it was the 50s. Um, I was so deprived of beauty there for a while. It's a natural state. It's really beautiful, the landscape, but it's uh, not beautiful in other ways. Um, Sorry. I was so deprived of culture, I feel uh, this circus came to town and it was just the most beautiful thing I saw. Uh, <laughs> when I saw the contortionist, um, this is one of those poems that sort of just wrote itself while I was seeing this woman contort herself. Um, I cry and uh, I wrote this poem, La Contorsionista. Ayer fuimos al circo y vimos a una contorsionista contorsionarse toda sobre una plataforma, mínima como su cuerpo. La gente aplaudía de pie. La contorsionista venía de muy lejos, según el narrador del circo. De tierras lejanas, la cintura como un pájaro loco, girando en círculos obscenos. La sonrisa elástica, los ojos tristes y muy quietos. Me tuve que tapar la cara en el momento culminante, cuando la contorsionista deja de ser alguien y se convierte en una masita redonda, pensé que nos, se nos rompía la mujer muñeca venida de tan lejos. Yo también vengo de lejos. Yo también me contorsiono toda, por dentro, como todo el mundo, sin aplausos ni sonrisa. The Contortionist Yesterday, we went to the circus and saw a contortionist contort all of herself on a platform as small as her body. People stood up to clap. The contortionist came from far away, according to the circus narrator, from remote lands, the waste, like a wild bird spinning in obscene circles, the elastic smile, the sad and very still eyes. I had to cover my face during the climax, when the contortionist is no longer someone and becomes a round little mass. I thought she would break our dull woman who had come from so far away. I too come from far away. I too contort all of myself. On the inside, like everyone else, neither with applause nor with a smile. Still life, eh, naturaleza muerta. Um, I like this poem because it, it um, I publish it in an online journal that lets people comment on it, and I get a lot of hate, this poem. <laughs> For some reason, I, I thought it was so inoffensive. I'm just talking about fruit, but people got upset. They claimed it wasn't a poem. Um, why was I publishing there? Why was this poem published? It was really fun. Um, <laughs> The, the director of the journal intervened in the comments and explained why this was a poem. I thought it was just wonderful um, <laughs> what happened with it. Um, and I thought it was a funny poem, but I, I, I get it has some existential drama in the background. It's, it's, we were in Arkansas and we were buying way too much fruit at Walmart. We would bring it home and the fruit would go bad and we never ate it. So. It's just, uh, I was one day in the kitchen and I was staring at the fruit going bad again. And I knew I was going to throw it without eating it. And uh, I wrote this poem. Still life. I'm going to read this one in English. The fruit that's in the basket where the fruit has always been has recently unleashed a great sadness. It remains unclear why the fruit is undergoing a kind of suffering that is perhaps linked to a malady of the soul. There are, of course, moments that are harder to endure than others, especially in the afternoon when the fruit seems to want to leave us, as if, as if it were fed up with us or as if it wished to cry this ungrateful fruit. There's also the light which, depending on the time of day, Heightens this feeling of a little terror, a little sorrow, a little compassion. These three occur at different stages of the day and the fruit's consciousness that envelops it. We haven't talked, he and I, about this problem, the fruit problem, about the sadness that the fruit has unleashed, 
but I know he feels it too. It's getting increasingly harder for instant to go to the supermarket. We look at the fruit all puzzle, feel it in our hands in anger and gloom, go back home with the weight of the fruit, as if we were planning some form of vengeance or torture. <gasps> My time is up. Against ourselves or against the fruit, it's all the same. We'll get over it, I say. We'll be at peace once again with the fruit. He must have thought. I've already started to lose faith in this daily struggle between the violence of our tranquility and the sadness that has overcome the fruit. Thank you very much. Gracias, Margarita. Next up, from UC Merced, pero con raíces en Colombia, está Carlos Acevedo, Carlo Acevedo author of Fortuna del Día. And the translation of his first collection of poems won the Sundial Literary Translation Award. And this fortune will be published in 2024 by Columbia University Press. Please welcome Carlo Acevedo. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, uh, thank you everybody for being here. I mean, I always appreciate it when people actually take out of their time to appreciate poetry, to enjoy poetry, especially on a Friday in the evening. So uh, it's really appreciated by myself and all of us, I, I, yes, I agree. So today I'm gonna read a selection uh, of poems from my first collection of poems. Uh, it was published first in 2019. As Fortuna del Día, and its uh, translation, Days Fortune, will be published later, like in September or October this year. Uh, so I don't have any copies of my original book in Spanish or the book in English, so we will share this copy that I uh, designed. Um, about the book uh, or the poems, uh, it has more or less three, well, not more or less, it has three different registers. Uh, it has free verse poems. Uh, haiku and very, very, very small, brief, like prose poems, I call them. Uh, they don't have, so I more or less prepare the selection of each. And they don't have any titles, so assume after a brief silence, a new poem, but well, after I'm done, the trans <laughs> <laughs> uh, after I finish reading my versions in Spanish, you will hear the version in English, so you will get it. So, okay. So, what? Simplemente sentarse. El canto del grillo es el canto del grillo cuando la luz del día y las ramas de los árboles se reúnen en dos convicciones. Quietud y silencio. Do nothing but sit. The cricket's song is the cricket's song when daylight and tree branches meet in two certainties, stillness and silence. Uh, okay, and now I'm gonna read the poem that actually gives the title <clears throat> to the whole book. Um, so here it goes. Fortuna del día. La luz da a cada mañana su propio disfraz. Pero no hay señuelo o somnífero que burle a la noche que arrastra entre las horas su jadear de loba solitaria. Day's fortune. Light gives each morning its own disguise. But there's no decoy or sleep aid to mock the night which drags through the hours its panting of a solitary wolf. And I actually think that the next poem is one of my favorite of the collection. I don't know if you'd like it, but I kind of like it. <laughs> eh, donde se me ha revelado la presencia de Dios. Las cáscaras de huevo en el bote de basura. Los dientes de león que bordean la tapa de la alcantarilla. Los troncos incendiados del otoño de Iowa. El cabello de Alba goteando en mi mano. 
where God's presence has revealed itself to me, the eggshells in the trash can, the dandelions ringing the sewer grate, the flaming trees in the Iowa autumn, Abba's hair dripping into my palm. Okay. Um, the next poem has an epigraph uh, by Claudio Rodriguez, a Spanish poet, so that will be like the start of the night. Mi boca solo llega al signo. Claudio Rodriguez. No quiero nombrar al álamo. Quiero decir al álamo que mi palabra sea el rumor de su frondosidad. This has an epigraph by Claudio Rodriguez. My mouth only makes it to the sign. I don't want to name the poplar. I want to speak the poplar. Let my words be the murmur of its leafiness. Mm. By the way, I want to point out something. This translation was done by a dear friend of mine, Kelsey Banada. Um, she, I met her many years ago in Iowa while we were both in grad school. She's also an amazing poet. So if we're able to enjoy these translations, it's because of her. Um, no. El picor en la yema al rozar la grama de verano. El olor a madera en las mañanas lluviosas. El ardor en el abdomen en las horas del hambre. Los labios de la hija que me besan la frente. Como el rocío en la brisna, todo acabará. Um, the itch as fingertips. Brushed summer grasses, the woody smell of rainy mornings, the burning in the belly during hungry hours, the lips of the daughter that kiss my forehead. Like dew on blades of grass, everything will come to an end. Okay, and, and the next poem will be the last free verse poem that I'm going to read. I'm going to transition to the haiku. So here it goes. Um, En este punto del mediodía, sobre el agua azul de la gruta, una mínima porción de cielo. La sal está hecha de cristales. Me llevo uno a la boca. Todo me sabe a casa. At this point of midday, on the blue water of the grotto, a tiny share of sky. Salt is made of crystals. I raise one to my mouth. Everything tastes of home. And now the first haiku. Nunca una rosa logró mayor belleza que en la distancia. A rose never achieved greater beauty than in the distance. I kind of like this one as well, the one that's coming up. <laughs> Llegó la noche, en mi pecho otra luna, es la nostalgia. <clears throat> Evening has arrived, another moon on my chest, it's nostalgia. La carretera a lo lejos promete trozos de cielo. Just three lines. Yeah. <laughs> the highway afar off promises chunks of sky. Yeah, and yeah I've said this a lot, but I think that the next poem is my favorite poem of the book. <laughs> For, I mean, for sure. <laughs> I don't know why, but yeah. So, um, de donde vienen la noche, las luciérnagas, y esta pregunta. Where do night 
fireflies and this question come from? Okay. And, and well, we're approaching like the last part of the reading, of my part, I mean. Uh, I'm going to read the very brief uh, prose poems. So. Mi abuelo Virgilio me llama desde las linderas de mi niñez. Me exige ser un hombre. ¿Qué es ser un hombre? Le pregunto. My grandfather Virgilio calls to me from the boundaries of my childhood. He demands I be a man. What does, what does it mean to be a man? I ask him. And I think that the following poem actually is kind of different from the rest uh, because uh, it's a little bit more abstract. I mean, it like plays with this poem by William Blake, Agoris of Innocence. Um, I think that the rest of the poems are very concrete. This one is like a little bit more playful or abstract or based on images. So um, I guess that it sets like a different tone. Blake no se equivocó. Un paraíso cabe en el cuchillo de un carnicero. El pecho de un petirrojo haría temblar, la, temblar las nobles verdades del Buda. Un niño que mata una mosca, acá hay el canto de un querubín. La furia del buey puede amansar a la más altanera de las noches. I think that's one of my favorites. <laughs> um, if not my favorite, um, it's one that I... I latched on to. Blake, oh, Blake wasn't wrong. A paradise fits in a butcher's knife. A robin's red breast would, would shake the Buddha's noble truths. A child who kills a fly silences the song of a cherubim. The rage of an ox can tame the most high and mighty of nights. Yeah, I think that Kelsey did a great job with this one, especially with that last line, like um, the rage of an ox can tame the most high and might of nights. I think that that was really creative and really powerful to, to contain what, what it actually said in Spanish. Well translated. Yeah, exactly. And the following poem is the one that's close in my part of the reading. It's actually the last poem of this book, so uh, here it goes. Mi sombra palpita según dispone la marea. Ráfagas de espuma blanca, islas de burbujas que se dispersan y el ondular sutil de la superficie cargada con el color cavernoso de la arena del lecho. El ciclo se repite, nunca dos veces igual, siempre igualmente perfecto. <coughs> My shadow throbs with the air, with the tide. Bursts of white foam, islands of bubbles scattering, and the gentle undulation of the surface laden with the gravelly color of the sand of the seabed. The cycle repeats, never the same twice, always equally perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Buenos poemas, Carlos. Muchas gracias. Next up is Gloria Álvarez. Her books of poetry in English and Spanish include La Excusa, The Excuse, and Emerging en un Mar de Olanes. Spoken words albums include Center Ground and Between Epiphanies. Uh, please welcome Gloria Álvarez. <clears throat> Buenas noches. Un placer estar aquí con ustedes. Uh, I thank my father for forcing us to speak only Spanish at home, which led me to teach myself how to read and write in Spanish. Words are wings, our shadows are bile and rain, fire and snow with honey of the day from night to noon. Palabras son alas 
Son sombras, son hiel y lluvia, fuego y nieve con miel de día, de tarde, noche. Siempre desde un beso inmortal, retazos de duda robados, milagro a través de los ojos, la vida arriba. Life arrives always from an immortal kiss, pieces taken from doubt, a miracle exchanged through the eyes. Velocity of time, entre latidos, one long conversation in hummingbird wings, jade light motions, thunder past circles, brushed against the breast, adds a flash of turquoise, elongates el viento between beats, breath speaks. Velocidad del tiempo en alas de colibrí borders the heart. Taken by the river, rushing past me, reeds vibrate, swirling, swish, swish. Tamarind dust hits my face, the taste and smell, earth's closeness, tamarinda acidez. A constant tickle against the throat. Lo agridulce takes me to my mother's breast. Los senos de mi madre, un rocío de voces. Mujeres sewing desde la alta costura. Mujeres organizing las cosas de la vida. Las cosas habitadas con acidez. Esa acidez en la piel. Women organizing life. A mist of voices embroidered, bittersweet against the skin. Inhabited limón con miel. Cucumber and honey. The cooling comfort of yerbabuena. Mi nana, mi tía. Todas ellas en el bordado sobre el tocador. Rosewood, cedro, wet hair glistens in the sun, luciéndose en el sol de la mañana. Voices are the dew of morning, baño de rosas para saber de hoy, del más allá. To know today and the beyond. Rose water, la sensualidad del tacto sobre el día de una mujer. Finding the words, encuentro de palabras habitadas, suben y bajan las manos, fingers that rise and fall. Luz de luz, oraciones bordadas nítidas al fondo, corredizas y constantes, de luz a luz, she of the waters in a limitless blue, free and constant, en azul ilimitado, light of light from light to light, la de las aguas, multitudes de formas, precious liquid is your altar in multitudinous forms, Luz a luz, vidas a ella, light to light at her hem, lives to her, claim murmurs of peace. Vidas a ella, a su bastilla, claman murmuros de paz, stitch prayers neatly below. My father's slippers, my father's shoes, he said to me, wear them if you don't feel Asco. What? How could I feel asco when I feel the warmth of the wrinkles and furrowed creases of time on sidewalks and pavement, the soft black dirt moistened by the oil that thickens the grass where you walked and stood and crouched, your back arched and ached against and underneath the cars, that day by day you patiently revived, sometimes caressed or chastised into one more ride to the factory, where you bent steel to the touch, cut metal with the precision of a surgeon, with a diamond cutter's mark, to the tiendita by Central Avenue, south of the center, centered at Patti's Deli, Tamales, carnitas, crunchy chicharrones, menudo, jalapeños que no falten, pico de gallo and chiles güeritos. The next stop reserved for Sundays, 
milk and eggs with some tortillas for now. On to Mario Caseta's folkways of the world on the dial. Back to the six children and the wife, the daughters who dress up in the Esperanza's flamenco costumes. Endless ruffles, cotton aqua peppered with black beauty marks. Those black moons balanced upon the open sea of the dresses, rippling and cascading. Black onyx raw silk curves, rusted silver safety pins striped the back. As my sisters and I danced ballet, sang opera, then came home to mambo, Perez Prado, Danzón, Acerina, on to the bullfight, Paso Doble, someone would die. El Relicario with Sarita Montiel, finally Los Trios, Los Panchos with Edie Gourmet, Cerca del Mar, La Barca de Oro, Gema, and Usted. Mexican balance drowned by our mother's commands towards Mujercitas, household duties, and by the sound of the twirling ice in our father's rum and coke glass, Pura Vida, Cuba Libre, Vida pura. Again, I feel the warmth of my father's joy and pain, love and strength, compassion and endurance, the brilliance and pride of a fourth grade education and a lifetime of hard work, clarity, wisdom, service to skilled devotion for his uprooted home from Wyoming, his displaced people, from Wyoming to Jalisco, following his heart and his family. From Jalisco to Los Angeles, how many U.S. citizens repatriated? How many lost but found? Found as we name ourselves, name the loss and find ourselves. I touch the soft suede, the map of my father. Tropical storm crosses over Los Angeles. When I step into the sheepskin, I step into my father's shoes. Amparo Sanctuary. Start with the hum of the universe. Stop with the O of the infinite, the unending circle. An echo falls into the abyss to rise over and over. Una mano apretada, fija en el titubeo, ancha y segura, como la mañana. Su inocencia asoma, fixed amidst doubt, safe and wide, a hand wrapped like morning or tomorrow. Innocence pierced forth to provide refuge and protection from harm that could befall. A white dove that flew in through the window, her last breath perched above her bed, una ofrenda a su hermana, el último suspiro, an offering to her sister, as she too feels the absence of breath. Su nombre lleva la fuerza de su abuela, el refugio, roca balanceada sobre la mañana entre la piedra amarilla y el río blanco que corre colorado. Her name carries her grandmother's strength, the refuge, boulder balanced above the mountain between Yellowstone and the white river that winds red. Mamá Amparo, who walked through a blizzard with her mother, Sarita, to save Alfredo, her father. Amparo, feet numbed with frostbite. Child bride of Rafael that worked for the railroad that gave her Alfredo, her rock, born in the plains of Cheyenne, involuntarily returned to Zacatecas on the same train that brought her from that land, her exiled son, child provider, wise protector, who with Enedina in Jalisco fathered her grandchild, Amparo. Caminó los pasos congelados de Abuela Amparo con su madre Sara, salvó Alfredo, su padre, niña esposa de Rafael que trabajaba para el ferrocarril, que le dio a Alfredo su roca, nació en lo plano de Cheyenne para retornar a Zacatecas sin su voluntad, en el mismo tren que la trajo de esa tierra. Su progénito exiliado, niño proveedor, sabio protector, quien con Enedina en Jalisco trajo a su nieta, el santuario de Amparito, que murió antes de mi luz. Juntamos 
las memorias, cerca lo profundo de la montaña, comenzamos día por día a encontrar las piedras que nombran, testimonios que enseñan la fuerza de saber escuchar. Amparito, who died before my birth, together we find and gather the memories hidden deep near the mountain, start day by day to find the stones that name, bear witness, and teach the strength to truly listen. Mil gracias. Gloria Álvarez, desde Tierras Lejanas de Silver Lake. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our last poet is the one and only Frank Bias. He's published six books of poetry, a short story collection, and three nonfiction books. He last, his last poetry book is The End of the World Came to My Neighborhood. Please welcome Frank Bias the Anthony Seidman. Hello. Um, Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm so happy for, you know, my fellow poets. They are so great and so in inspire people like, so cool to have them around. And thank you, Anthony, for the translation and for everything. And, and also Beyond Baroque and my friend Esther. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm gonna read this poem. I, I wrote this poem like um, 20 years ago. Um, I don't know, I think it's still work. Autorretrato. Rodé al año y medio por las escaleras hasta el segundo piso. A los seis casi me ahogo en una piscina. A los siete me arrastró la corriente de un río. Me golpearon con un palo, con la culata de un fusil, con una tabla. Me propinaron un codazo en la cara y otro en el estómago. Rodillazos, machetazos, fuetazos. El perro del vecino me mordió un brazo. Me cortaron una oreja haciéndome el cerquillo. Noqueado, abofeteado, calumniado, abuchado, apedreado. Perseguido por sargentos en motor, por seis cobradores, por siete mormones en bicicleta, por muchachas de Herrera y del Trece. Me han atracado 30 veces en carros públicos, taxis, voladoras, a pie. Alguien me dio una bola y me dijo, I am gay. Me robaron un televisor, un colchón, seis pares de tenis, cuatro carteras, un reloj, media biblioteca. Se llevaron varios manuscritos y cometieron plagio. Con lo que me han robado pudieran abrir una compraventa en los prados. Me fracturé el brazo derecho, el anular, la cadera, el fémur y perdí cuatro dientes. El hermano Abelardo me dio un cocotazo que todavía me duele. En la fiesta de graduación me cayeron a trompadas y botellazos. Luego publiqué un libro de poesía y una vecina lo leyó y escéptica dijo que era capaz de escribir mejores poemas en media hora y lo hizo. Accidente con un burro en la carretera, intento de suicidio en cabarete, taquicardia, hepatitis, hígado jodido, satanizado en Europa del Este, pateado por mexicanos en Chicago, en Montecristi, una mesera me amenazó de muerte, ahora mismo clava alfileres en un muñeco idéntico a mí. Los vecinos sueñan conmigo baleado, los poetas con dedicarme elegías, otros con rociarme gasolina en la cabeza, y arrojar un fósforo y ver mis rizos en llamas. Otras con llevarme a la cama. Y hace semanas un policía me detiene y me pregunta si no era el poeta que había leído poesía aquella noche. Y le digo que sí. Y el policía dice que son buenos poemas. Y hace una reverencia o algo así. Okay. Ah. It's a great pleasure to read the translations I did of Frank Baez aquí and Beyond Baroque. So this is self-portrait. Year and a half old, I rolled down the stairs to the second floor. Six, I almost drowned in the pool. At seven, a river current dragged me. They hit me with a stick, with a rifle's butt, with a two by four. They elbowed me in the face and again in the stomach, kneed me 
struck me with machetes and fists. The neighbor's dog gnarled my arm. They cut my ear while shaping my sideburns. Knocked out, slapped, slandered, booed, stoned, hounded by sergeants astride motorcycles, by two debt collectors, by three Mormons peddling their 10 speeds, by girls from the hood. I've been mugged 30 times in vans, taxis, speeding buses, on foot. He hooked me up with a ride, and then he said to me, hey, I'm gay. They stole a television, a mattress, six pairs of sneakers, four wallets, a watch, half of the titles from my bookshelves. They carried off my manuscripts and committed plagiary. With all the junk they stole, one might as well open a pawn shop for the middle class. I broke my, white, my right arm, the annular, the hip, the femur, and I lost four teeth. Brother Abelardo gave me a headbutt that still aches. At my graduation ceremony, they jumped me with blows and bottles. Soon after, I published a collection of verse and a skeptical neighbor thumbed through it and promptly said she could scribble better poems in the blink of an eye, and she did so. A burro incident on the highway, attempted suicide at a beach resort, tachyardia, hepatitis, liver all fucked up, satanized in Eastern Europe, stomped by Mexicans in Chicago. A waitress at Monte Cristo swore she would kill me. Even now she's sticking pins into a doll of my spitting image. Neighbors dream of my bullet-riddled corpse. Some poets dream of writing odes to me. Others of spraying gasoline on my head, striking a match, then seeing my ringlets crackle ablaze. Others getting me into the sack. Just a few weeks ago, a cop stopped me and he asked me, hey, wasn't you that poet who recited poems one night? And I tell him, yep. And the cop says, well, those were some good damn poems. And then he gives me a little bow. <laughs> okay, I want to read this one, the number five, um, because it's about the, um, you know, the Dominican um, migration experience. Um, it's the experience of a lot of my friends and all that. I grew up in Santo Domingo and I've been in Santo Domingo my whole life. Like, you know, now I'm living in Austin, but uh, for a short period. But uh, this is really like a Dominican experience. Um, it said, Todas las Navidades recibíamos los regalos que nos enviaban desde los Estados Unidos, Barbies. Carritos a control remoto, Nintendos, libros, cómics, casetes y videos. Para vacaciones nos enviaban zapatos, ropa, tenis de marca y guantes de pelota. Hasta teníamos los cubrecamas del hombre araña. Desde la infancia nuestra vida estuvo subtitulada. Todo era una preparación para cuando emigráramos, sentados en las marquesinas, esperábamos. Each Christmas, we received presents they sent us from the United States. Barbies, remote control cars, Nintendos, books, Game Boys, cassettes, and videotapes. For vacation, they sent shoes, clothing, brand name sneakers, and baseball gloves. We even had Spider-Man comforters. Ever since childhood, our life had subtitles. Everything was a prepping for when we would immigrate. Seated in driveways, we waited. Okay. Okay.
Okay. Um, this is also about migration, no? La primera vez fue cuando mi papá vino a Nueva York con la maleta llena de Milky Ways. Y yo probé uno y me sentí como en esa escena de Charlie y la fábrica de chocolates en que el protagonista se esconde para ver si su chocolate está premiado. Aunque yo me escondía más bien para que mi mamá no me quitara los chocolates y les llevé a Pascual y al Seba, a quienes se engancharon tanto, al punto que cada vez que me veían acercarme con los bolsillos llenos de Milky Way, babiaban como el perro de Pavlov. Y después que probé los Milky Way, los Rocky Keys llenos de almendra, no me sabían a nada. Los Crashy, los Más Más, los Chocolates Embajador, todos habían perdido su magia. Y recuerdo que cuando en la clase de religión el cura hablaba del éxodo de los judíos por el desierto y del maná que Dios lanzaba desde el cielo para que se alimentaran y no se murieran de hambre antes de llegar a la tierra prometida, yo imaginaba que el maná eran pedacitos de Milky Way que caían sobre la arena y sobre las piedras y la analogía cobró más fuerza cuando supe que Milky Way significaba Vía Láctea. Así que piensen en esos publicistas buscándole nombre a ese producto, imaginando que no hay nada más sublime que comerse una estrella. Y bueno, ya han pasado dos décadas, tenía años que no probaba un Milky Way. La verdad, hoy en día prefiero los sneakers. Pascual y el Seba se fueron al norte. No sé bien en qué ciudad vive Pascual, pero sé que el Seba vive en Nueva York, específicamente en el Bronx. La semana pasada nos vimos y paseamos por Manhattan. En un momento Seba entró en 7-Eleven para usar el baño y yo compré un Milky Way. Y le pregunté al Seba si le apetecía recordar los viejos tiempos, pero el Seba me dijo que ya no comía dulces, que era propenso a la diabetes. Así que yo me comí el Milky Way solo, andando con el Seba por las calles de Manhattan, mirando de vez en cuando hacia arriba, donde había tanta niebla y tantas luces que no se alcanzaban a ver las estrellas y mucho menos la Vía Láctea. Again, another poem that was a great pleasure to translate. The first time was when Dad returned from New York with a suitcase full of Milky Ways, and I bit into one and felt like I was in that scene of Charlie in the Chocolate Factory in which the protagonist hides to see if his chocolate wins the prize. Although I hid it even better so that my mother wouldn't swipe my chocolates, and I took them to Pascual and Seba, who became so hooked that every time they saw me approaching with pockets full of Milky Way, they drooled like Pavla's dog. And after I tried the Milky Way, brands like Rocky Kid full of almonds didn't taste like anything to me. Even Crachi or Mas Mas or Embajador Bars, all of them lost their magic. And I remember how during religion class, The priest spoke of the Jewish desert exodus and of the mana God tossed them from heaven so they could eat and not die of hunger before reaching the promised land. And I imagined that the mana were small chunks of Milky Way that fell on the sand and on the stones and the analogy gathered more strength when I found out what Milky Way meant in Spanish. So just think about those advertising executives looking for a name for that product and imagining there's nothing more sublime than gobbling up a star. And well, two decades have passed. I've gone years without trying a Milky Way. And truth is, nowadays, I prefer Snickers, Pascual and Seba moved to the north. I don't know in which city Pascual lives, but I knew Seba lives in New York, specifically in the Bronx. And we saw one another last week and roamed Manhattan. When Seba entered a 7-Eleven to use the bathroom, I bought a Milky Way. And I asked Seba if he hungered to remember those old days 
But Sava told me he no longer ate candy. He has a propensity for diabetes. And so I ate the Milky Way by myself. Walking with Sava down those Manhattan avenues, gazing up from time to time, when there was so much fog and light, it proved impossible to see the stars and much less the Milky Way. Okay, uh, I want to read this point about my father's um, last haircut. Um, no, I mean, it's pretty sad, it's like, and I remember when I, when I wrote it, I was really like, uh, you know, emotional, like sitting in, in his uh, desk. And I wrote this poem, like, it was like, a, I don't know how to say it, like, a, a, I, I mean, it was... Catharsis. Yeah, like a kind of catharsis, yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, I, I, it, it was like this burden that I had, like all this month about my father's death, finally I let it down. So it's point about that is the number uh, 33. So, antes de ir al hospital, acompañé a mi padre a recortarse el pelo y el barbero de brazos tatuados limpió el sillón con un trapo como si se tratara de un trono y mi padre con su barba y sus lentes dudó en sentarse porque él odiaba cualquier privilegio y se iba a esa barbería donde los decibeles del reggaetón y de las salsas rompían los tímpanos de los clientes era porque se sentía como en casa y las tijeras del barbero eran un pájaro que aleteaba sobre la cabeza de mi padre y entonaba una canción que era imperceptible para los mortales. Era una canción sobre la muerte y ese era el último corte que se haría a mi padre. Y eso no lo sabía el barbero, no lo sabía yo, no lo sabía nadie. Afuera brillaba el sol, avanzaba el viernes y los otros barberos trasquilaban con sus maquinitas las cabezas de otros clientes. A veces he pensado en ir a la barbería y contarle al barbero de brazos tatuados que mi padre ha muerto. O quizás no decirle nada y sentarme a que me recorte con esas tijeras que aletearon como un pájaro sobre la cabeza de mi padre. Entonces sabría el significado de la lúgubre canción que las tijeras entonaron. Comprendería y sería como siempre demasiado tarde. Wow. Ah. I think we have, might have time for... Uh, one poem, but this is a very beautiful poem that closes in, in this book, which is for, for sale tonight, which closes a, a whole sequence on uh, meditation on Frank's life in Santo Domingo and also his father and the passing of his father. Before going to the hospital, I accompanied my father for a haircut and the barber with tattooed arms polished the seat with a rag as if it were a throne. And my father with his beard and glasses hesitated before sitting because he loathed all privileges. And if he frequented the barber shop where the decibels of reggaeton and salsa music shattered the eardrums of the clientele, it was because he felt at home and the barber's clippers were a bird fluttering over my father's head, and it intoned a song which was imperceptible to mortals. It was a song about death, and that was the last haircut my father would have, and the barber did not know that, nor did I know that. No one knew. Outside, the sun was shining. Friday was approaching. And the other barbers sheared the heads of their clients with their little machines. At times, I have thought of going to the barber shop to tell the barber with tattooed arms that my father has died. 
or perhaps not tell him a thing, just sit down so he can cut my hair with those clippers that fluttered like a bird over my father's head. Then I would know the significance of the lugubrious song the clippers intoned. I would understand, and it would be, as always, far too late. Un poema más, eso de, de la Biblia, que nadie fume en la Biblia. Sí, para, para terminar. Okay. Sí. One last poem. <laughs> en la Biblia no aparece nadie fumando. Pero qué tal si diosos los que escribieron la Biblia se olvidaron de agregar los cigarros. Y en realidad todas esas figuras bíblicas se pasaban el día entero fumando. Al igual que en los 50, en que se podía fumar en los aviones y hasta en la televisión. Yo imagino a todos esos gloriosos judíos llevándose sus cigarrillos a los labios y expulsando el humo por las narices en lo que aguardan por sus visiones o porque Dios les hable. Imagino a David tocando el arpa en un templo lleno de humo. A Abraham fumando cigarro tras cigarro antes de decidirse a matar a Isaac. A María fumando antes de darle a José la noticia de que está embarazada. E incluso imagino a Jesús sacando un cigarrillo detrás de la oreja y fumando para relajarse antes de dirigirse a las multitudes reunidas en torno suyo. Yo no soy un fumador, pero a veces me vienen ganas y fumo, como en este instante en que miro la lluvia caer tras la ventana y me siento como Noé cuando esperaba que pasara el diluvio y se la pasaba de arriba a abajo por todo el arca buscando donde había puesto esa maldita cajetilla. <risa> I read this to, to one of my best friends. He said, but you forgot Cain and Abel. Can you imagine? Oh, Cain, oh my God. Oh, what am I going to say? No smoking in the Bible. But what if God, or those who wrote the Bible, forgot to include the cigarettes? And in reality, those biblical figures spent the day puff, puff, puffing. Just like how in the 50s one could smoke on board airplanes and even on television. And I imagine those glorious Jews raising cigs to their lips, expelling smoke from their nostrils while awaiting visions or God to address them. And I imagine David plucking the harp in a smoke-webbed temple and Abraham chain-smoking before deciding to kill Isaac. Heck, and Maria lighting up before breaking the news to Joseph that she was pregnant. Heck, I even imagine Jesus pulling out a cigarette from behind his ear and scratching a match to take a breather be before addressing the masses gathered around him. Now, I'm no smoker, but sometimes I get the urge and I light up just like this moment as I watch the rain, all cats and dogs outside the window, and I feel like I'm Noah when he was waiting for the flood to cease, and how he trudged up and down the ark, just trying to figure out where he had left that damned fucking pack. <laughs> All right, round of applause for all our poets. <laughs> yeah, so we're gonna do a bit of a, a panel, so uh, just give us a minute. We're gonna pull this podium out of the, out of the way. Okay.
we're, we're just waiting for Carlos to return, but I think we can start with yeah, the yeah, following. Yeah. Um, I, I just have one question for the poets here, and then I'm gonna open it up uh, to the audience. Uh, the question I have is, of course, with the poetry of the Dominican Republic and the, the diaspora to uh, New York and, and elsewhere, Puerto Rican poetry as well, and Chicano poetry, there's this idea of always of the bilingual element, the presence of English. So how has that been um, something that has been problematic or has something that has been fruitful that has helped assist with uh, the creation of the poetry that you do? Uh, uh, whether or not it's been problematic. Uh, or, or fruitful, or, 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 or both. Or both. Or, 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 both. <laughs> or, aesthetically, or aesthetically stimulating. I mean, even. even. Uh, well, you know, I uh, I always I thought, God, you know, if I if I'm if I'm writing in both languages, that means I can reach a wider audience. Uh, but then I started seeing that. Um, you know, it wasn't always that way. Uh, I had uh, several publishers not accept work from me um, because it had, uh, you know, because I was using both languages and they were asking me to choose, and they were asking me to choose English. Uh, so, uh, so I've been playing with translation, uh, you know, since I've been writing. So when I started writing, I, well, this is going kind of long, uh, but uh, I was writing in both in Spanish, uh, and then I started as a challenge, you know, to challenge myself. Um, I, I started translating most of what I was writing, and um, it's still kind of, sometimes kind of hard because I think in both all the time, and I switch back and forth. Uh, so sometimes, you know, when it, when it began in English, I'd go to Spanish, and, and so I would kind of comb it through, and then I just was like, why am I doing this? And so I try to choose in the selection of what I read so that you could get kind of an idea of of how it's, um, you know, I think things are changing. I know I have been criticized for uh, writing in Spanish, uh, for translating myself, um, but that's the experience, I think. And, uh, and I think it's pretty much with everyone. It seems, I shouldn't say that, but I guess at least for myself, um, I think it's fruitful, so. Yeah. Um, well, I lived in Puerto Rico for 26 years, and it was all in Spanish. Um, we take English in school, but it's not, you know, it's, many of my teachers didn't speak English. <laughs> they were teaching it, but um, um, being a U.S. territory also presents a challenge. Um, there's a lot of influence of English in the island, but at the same time, there's a lot of resistance uh, to English. I come from a family that is uh, nationalist, and they are pro-independence. So speaking Spanish, I mean, speaking English or, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't bad, but it, it wasn't expected. Um, when I moved to, to Atlanta um, from Puerto Rico to, to do grad school, that's like the first time I'm just completely immersed in English. Um, I fell in love with a man who didn't speak Spanish, and because of him, I fell in love with English, um, truly. Um, I believe that since I became fully bilingual, my poetry changed, definitely. I think there's a big difference between my first book published and the, the most recent one. Um, I was so confident in Spanish. Um, my poems were longer and they were more maybe, I don't know, uh, Baroque, I don't know, more elaborate, you know? I was enjoying too much Spanish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right, thank you. Um, and then when I became bilingual, it's like, it's hard as an adult, um, such a challenge, but also it, I, I've, I, it did something really cool to my poetry, I think. Um, because it's language and you realize that 
you're not done with, I'm not done with Spanish either. <laughs> I keep learning. Um, and now with, with English, well, yeah, I, also it has expanded. Um, it has opened a lot of doors. I think we writers want to be read. So when your work is translated, that's just, you know, that's just more readers for you. I got to say that um, I have received um, mixed reactions since I started, because I'm also writing in English since, in the last four or five years, I started writing in English. I still write mostly in Spanish, but you know, I, I feel comfortable enough. Um, and I have received criticism and uh, mixed reviews from um, friends and poets in Puerto Rico who, um, they, I think they wish I didn't. <laughs> I, I only wrote in Spanish. Um, so it's, it's interesting. Um, I'm happy with, with what's happening, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying writing in both and uh, living in both. I have another one here. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I think like living in the Dominican Republic or the Caribbean, you have the experience of the both languages. Sp um, I mean, Spanish and, and English, like uh, because of the media, because television, the music, and all that. So it's like, I mean, it's really there. It's, in my case, I try to write in Spanish, but even if I try to write like in the most Spanish way possible, some English influence is gonna appear, you know, like in a natural way. It's not, like, uh, so uh, I had not that, I don't, I don't have like any problem with that. It's like, uh, sometimes it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, for example, when you were translating my points, that point about the Milky Way, is about uh, an English word, uh, two English words, right? So uh, when you did translate that, so I mean, you did something like really interesting because you were translating uh, the English at the same time, you know? And I, I really like that because I think everything, when you're writing uh, poetry or you're writing about everything, everything is about translation. I mean, you are translating, uh, to communicate to a person, you to try to translate what that person think about the war and all that. So, you know, it's about contest and translation. Mm -hmm. So I think we are translating all the time. Um, and that's one scene. And the other is like, uh, uh, yeah, and I had like this bad relationship with the, with the English, not like you, because... That's really interesting, the, the, the relationship with the, the political yeah. and colonialist relationship that you have. But I have like this relationship with the middle high class in the Dominican Republic, you know, that they always like talking in English, you know, with, yeah. So it's like a scene of status, you know, like to speak proper English and all that. So I was really a, a punk. And for me, it was like, oh, I'm going to speak like, the worst English possible, like <laughs> to distinguish from from these people, you know. So yeah, I had a, I had that problem, and and I really love the way that the Dominican in, in New York speak. Uh, I really love that that way, and the scene that they invented when they try when they start speaking in uh, in English with. Uh, you know, like trying to de deconstruct the, 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 the language. So I think that's really uh, fruitful, like really, re really interesting. I mean, the way you Chicano people uh, do it is, is the same thing. And, and I think that's where the real literature is, you know, in that effort to change the, the language and to communicate in a, in a, in a different level. Um, yeah. Y qué metáfora, ¿no? Eso de, de los dominicanos de Nueva York. Está heavy duty. Eso me fascina. Está heavy duty. Wow, what an image. <laughs> okay, well, um, I wasn't here when the question was asked, so I'm going to answer based on what I assume, but it wasn't based on what you basically like. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So yeah, actually you said something now that made me think that yeah, actually writing poetry, it's a, it's a, it's a work of translation as well because you're trying to translate into a verbal language 
something that happens in a different level, in a sensory level or a mnemonic level or emotional level. But well, coming back to the original question, um, I also grew up like in the Caribbean region of Colombia. So our slang and our spoken language has a lot of influence from English. Um, but in terms of my writing, I think that it never affected it that much or not that I was aware. And I lived here several years ago in Iowa uh, while going to grad school there. But, uh, and I wrote my first book there actually, but my community was mostly Hispanic. So 70 from a 75% to 80% of my life was going on in Spanish. So I didn't perceive any influence. But influences are there. I mean, like, I read a poem based on William Blake, and I tried to translate uh, some of his fragments into what I perceived that I could rewrite in Spanish. And I also have some other hidden intertextual relationships there based on texts that I read in, in English at first, or uh, Buddhist texts, and so on. So, yeah, I mean, it's always going on, but. Um, Actually, this time I came back to the United States a couple of years ago, and now it's the opposite. Like 80 to 90% of my life happens in English. And I noticed a few months after I arrived that, that I started to use English words or expressions in my poetry. And it came naturally. It wasn't like, like something that I decided previously. And it also happened to me what you mentioned. I mean, like, now my life happens in, in English. My emotional life happens in English. Uh, people that I care for can only understand English. And, and I actually have written certain poems in English because I want them to read them. And uh, it's the only way that I can communicate with them. But yeah, I also re now I remember the first poem that I wrote where actual English was like included. And the thing is that uh, I grew up besides the Caribbean Sea and uh, the air there is like full of moisture and humidity. But in Merced, where I live now, the air is so dry and my skin suffers a lot. And I wanted to write a poem about that. And I was, for some reason, it came like this. And I wrote it like this. I was like, en este pueblo, I have the hands of an old man. <laughs> so I mean, naturally it came in English for some reason. <laughs> but yeah, that was. Be before I, I, I ask for some questions from the audience just very briefly uh, it's a question that i think is um, important uh, dominican poetry has always existed in the margin of the latin american literary canyon canon i mean really it's only recently that people are reading pedro mir or they acknowledge the importance puerto rican poetry has always been perceived as something bilingual or not necessarily part of Latin, the Latin American culture. Um, same thing with uh, Chicano poetry. And then with, uh, I remember reading an article recently in Vuelta, an old edition from the 1980s, where uh, it was Mutis, Alvaro Mutis, writing an about an anthology of Colombian poetry where he said, but really in comparison to the rest of Latin American poetry, Colombian poetry doesn't have... Um, these great names. So f it's not true. I know that. And, and, and I, know, I know there's great Dominican poets. I know there's great Puerto Rican poets. But there is this, this idea within academia or among readers that this is a type of poetry that's on the margin. How do you deal with this? Or is it not important? Or is it important? Or do you try to promote the poetry of your country? Or, if it's, or is it of no importance whatsoever to you? Okay, so uh, I, I do understand this in a way. And well, the things that I think that the Colombian tradition in comparison with, I don't know, the Chilean tradition or the Argentinian tradition or yeah. the Mexican tradition that have been like in the avant-garde, like continually, yeah. Colombian poetry has been somehow, and I'm saying this in a respectful way, like kind of traditional, kind of conservative. Um, but still, I do think that right now, a lot of great stuff are being written and a lot of poets, I don't know, between my age or even younger and in their mid 40s or early 50s are writing like some great stuff. I mean, Frank knows a lot of them. A lot of them are friends, uh, both of us. So I don't understand where that comes from, uh, especially because I think that the avant-garde movements happened a lot in these three countries, especially Argentina, Chile and Mexico. Yeah. 
and uh, Colombia was never like on the top of it. But still, like, do you think that that we have a great Colombian tradition and that it should be known and that especially what's being written today and the influence that we have received from like also older poets uh, is relevant, it's really yeah. relevant. Yeah, so I don't know if I answered the question, but no, that's no, what no, I would say. It just, it was, yeah. I don't know, that's a conspiracy <laughs> theory. I mean, it's, it's like, yeah, I think it's part of the colonialism mm -hmm. idea of uh, that, the, you know, like Spain is the, mother of the language and then you had the the biggest colony mexico i don't know argentina chile and all that so i i hate that, that kind of thing i mean poetry is happening in in a different stage yeah. in a different place um yeah we had like a, a lot of great poets um i mean one of the most interesting things about the dominican republic and, and puerto rico is that uh, one of the best poets is, is a woman I mean, Salome Ureña and, and Julia de Burgos, yeah. the, yeah. Your, your grandma, <laughs> right? It's my last name, but she's not related, but All I right. don't say anything. <laughs> I, I want people was. to think we're related. Yeah, I thought she was. I made it up to, to say that. Yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, and that's the scene. We, we had great pots. And it's, I, I, I mean, uh, it's a great opportunity to, to know the Dominican Republic poetry and the Caribbean poetry is like, I mean, if they, they are still there, the, the books are there. It's like, if you start to compare uh, Franklin Simeza Burgos, for example, with uh, Neruda or Borges, you will find like they are in the same level. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I mean, it takes time to understand that uh, when you are young, Especially when I was young, I thought that the best poetry was that, that yeah, from Mexico, yeah. from Spain, from Argentina and all that. And suddenly I've been realizing like, man, we had like a great, great poet. And also we have like, uh, uh, like great writers and probably they are not recognized abroad, but we had to, we had to recognize them. And, and I don't know, to learn, to let people know that. And... And yeah, you know, I try like all the time like to encourage people to translate because I think that's that's really important. That's like a, probably like a, a thing to do to translate the poems and write about these great poets that we have, and and, and so that people can, you know, can like decide if we are that good at, as we think we are. But I think we are. I think that the Dominican Republic is uh, the best country in the world. <laughs> and that we had the great poets and all that. I, I really believe that. I don't know, probably I'm delusional. But uh, yeah. Yes, I think we're in a limbo in the Caribbean a little bit. Um, we're sort of rejected by South America and then we're also rejected by the North. So we're just kind of alone. Um, Growing up, for me, Dominican, uh, the poetry from the Dominican Republic has been essential. So it, ha it wasn't a blind spot for us. We were really, we were reading Cuban poetry and uh, poets from the Dom Dominican Republic. Um, I knew all the poets from Chile, Argentina, Mexico, uh, Peru. And uh, when I went to Argentina, nobody knew it. poets yeah. from Puerto Rico. So, you know, is their problem? Uh, yeah, I know more. Sure. I know more than them. I'm winning. Uh, <laughs> um, and now with Pat Bunny, I don't have anything else to say. You know, it's, it's the greatest savior. Uh, you know, so defiant with the use of language. Um, so, but I have to say, before becoming bicultural, meaning before leaving the island. I, ha I share some of those views. I didn't think that New York and poetry was that important. I didn't feel identified, you know? And you're so immature. It's like, well, it's not my experience. It's not good, you know? It's so, it's really immature. Yeah, <laughs> then, kind of yeah, yeah. And you're isolated and, and also you feel, again, Puerto Ricans feel very threatened. You know, it's like we, f we are a colony and we feel that we have to fight for Spanish. So when we have these greatest, uh, these great poets who are writing in English, we feel a mix of 
being proud and also being scared. Um, so yeah, so I changed definitely uh, once I, I, I moved out of the island and, and started interacting and learning and reading more because I realized how little I read in English, right? In, I, re I knew all the South American tradition and uh, from Spain, of course, but how, how poorly informed I was uh, in the English department. And, and there's wonderful poetry written in, in English. We don't read Chicano poetry in, in Puerto Rico. You know, you, it was something that I started doing after I, I left. And actually, when I was confronted with having to teach, you know, in college, and I had to just get immersed in, in, in uh, Chicano literature, which is amazing, and I feel that if I had the opportunity to go back to Puerto Rico and teach there, I would be all over, you know, pushing for, for, for that and, and teaching that literature. Um, yeah, I think, well, I think as you can see, I'm a lot older than the other poets sitting here. Um, but, you know, I when I grew up, uh, as I said, my father, uh, well, their, the family's experience, my, my father's family uh, came here, had been here three generations, and then uh, they were, during the 30s, repatriated. They, they were US citizens who came to work, you know, to build the railroad, and they were, they were sent to Mexico. Uh, and so my father uh, left, actually my father was the same age as I was when he brought us here, because I was born in Mexico, but I came when I was three years old here. So my father was three when they sent them back to Mexico. Uh, so he came back as a young man uh, and didn't speak English when he, when he came back to the US. Um, but he insisted that we speak Spanish, so my, so, I, you know, my my first tongue is Spanish, but then formal education, you know, we were shamed for speaking Spanish. Uh, thank God for my father and my mother who, you know, fought and resisted, you know, so that we, I never felt that, have never felt that. And part of, um, you know, my uh, wanting to teach myself how to how to read and speak Spanish on my own and to challenge myself to translate was because, you know, we, always having that, you know, being looked down upon, you know, because our, our Spanish is inferior, our English is inferior. Um, and then later on, uh, you know, as, as a writer, uh, and actually, uh, I guess I'll share this, you know, I remember the first time that I told someone, you know, out loud that I wanted to be a writer was a librarian. And she said, oh, no, you know, <laughs> you people, you know, that's for rich people. That's wow. not for you people. I get to college. I had to fight to, you know, get into college prep and go to college. And uh, then I you know, go to my English teacher and I tell him, I really want to be a writer, can you advise me? Oh no, you'll never be a writer, you speak Spanish, you have an accent, you'll never be a writer. Uh, so that just, you know, challenged me more to, to, um, to want to translate the work. And so that's why I've really, you know, have played with the translation of you know, both languages. And, and, and also, um, I didn't, you know, what made me fall in love with poetry was because there wasn't, um, you know, the, the Chicanos were not publishing yet when I was, you know, very young and, and you know, thirsty for that. Um, I did read some Mexican, I read Octavio Paz and you know some of the Mexican writers, um, but all that I did on my own. And then I discovered uh, the, the uh, Harlem Renaissance writers. And when I read Langston Hughes, that was it. I was like, you know, poetry, I'm a poet. I, I knew, I think, since I was four years old, but uh, you know, that was it for me. I was like, this is serious. And, uh, and then I finally read some, uh, 
I guess it, that was like late 60s, 70s, you know, some of the Chicano writers, which were all men. But then, thank goodness, you know, women, I think, have, you know, began to be at the forefront and the vanguard in the uh, Chicano literary tradition. So for me, you know, that translating has been my personal challenge. Uh, and then also, you know, teaching all ages from, you know, before pre-writing and, you know, all the way through. We have uh, time for, <laughs> before we wrap up, we have time for one or two questions from the audience. Is there someone who has a question that they wish to ask? Yeah, I have one. Yes. Um, forgive me if this was already answered, I stepped out. So my question is, for me, poetry is a lot about sound. There's content, but there's sound. I love to hear the sound, the musicality of the words, regardless of what they mean. When your work is translated by someone else and you hear it, how distanced or diminished is it from what you originally conceived? How much do you feel it's still yours? Because someone else has written that. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I completely agree with you. Uh, for me, sound, the phonetic experience of the poem is one of the most important aesthetic features. And when I'm writing and when I'm editing and when I'm going back to a poem, I always read it out loud. It's one of the things that actually mark how I make decisions, how I change a word, why I put, why, why I put it, why even I replace one. If I feel that there's like a certain, like it doesn't flow. I like to have it flow, at least from my perspective. And it has to do with my musicality as well, because as I usually say to my students, like musicality is not only based on rhyme. I mean, like poets usually pursue a certain flow in terms of sound. Um, but when it comes to translation, um, I still feel that these poems that were read today, for example, are foreign to me. Um, especially because the register is kind of different. And I think that in Spanish, in terms of these poems, I used a very like sober register, but in English, when it's translated, these words don't have like the same connotation. So it's actually sometimes hard to me to, to understand these poems uh, because these poems are not mine. I mean, like as Cesar Vallejo used to say, it's easy to translate a text, but translating poetry is a completely different thing because translating poetry has to do with, I don't know, what he considered to be the animal movements of the language, the emotional movements of the poet. So I think that actually these translations are new poems based on these ones that are the original ones. But I mean, I give complete credit and complete freedom to my, to my translator. I consider this to be like her work and yeah, I don't get to decide there in terms of sound, because she's the one who actually knows her language. That's what I would say. Um, I, can, I can go now. If, should I? Huh? Um, I'm very controlling with my poems and <laughs> the translations. I think if, if, if I didn't speak English, if I didn't know English, I would be helpless in a, in a sort of speak. I would have to trust my translator completely. But since that's not the case, it's a collaboration always. So I don't, they're not foreign poems to me. It's, I translate part. I, I annoy my translator a lot with that's not what, it, you know, we can do it better. <laughs> so I, I feel they're my poems. I don't feel that they're, I remember having that feeling, but I don't have that feeling anymore. They're not foreign to me. And uh, there's something, I think it's part of me falling in love with English. I just find that even kind of easier to rhyme in English, for instance. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I found a way to, to make it work. There are poems that are that I think are better in English, actually. Also, the process of translation, it's really revealing because you start looking at your original poem and why did I choose these words that are now so hard and why was so, I was so committed to this vocabulary that now in English, I want to be more open, you know, um, about it. Um, 
So in some cases, I think I would, I would call some of the translations more like renditions of the poems. Um, although I, I prefer a very literal translation, and the, that's a conversation I had with, with my translator. Um, I remember when we started this, this book, when I read the first poem, the first translation, I, I, I felt that immediately that she was much younger than me. This was something that came across. She's 20 years younger than me. And the vocabulary was kind of, it, it was not me even though it was a beautiful poem. And I told her, this is a stunning translation, but this is your poem. This is not my poem. And I spent so much time to make this poem sound weird. And I need that weirdness back to the poem. And she, she's so great and so bright. And she just, she understood completely the, the instruction. And since that moment, she just, she, yeah, she, she did great. I didn't have to, but yeah. It, it just, if I can add, just be, being a translator here, is that um, the tradition in any poetry of the world is that of translation. I mean, Edward Fitzgerald, the translations we have of the Rubaiyat, is a canonical text. Uh, the sonneteers, Sir Thomas Wyatt and others, were translating from Petrarch, and Petrarch was translating from the Provencal poets. It's always this constant process of exchanging from one language to another, kind of pouring uh, the essence of something. Uh, it's only because of Baudelaire that people are interested in reading Edgar Allan Poe in French. It's because what he did as a translator, how he recreated him through this, his skills as a translator. So that, that, that's just my, my point I want to... I have to... Well... I remember Pedro Mir used to say that um, music is the plot of poetry. So, uh, you know, if you want to like end at the point, it had to be musical, you know, it had to have the, like a beautiful coda sound and all that. So it's about music. Um, I had this experience because I was translated to Arab by an Egyptian poet. So, you know, uh, I didn't know any Arab at all. So I was really like lost, like, so, uh, so I went to Cairo to the, um, to the presentation of the book. And, you know, I was standing there, like listening to this guy and I realized that, and I was like, yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> but uh, I was so happy, you know? But I realized that he was doing something interesting when people start to laugh. And I say, wow, he's reading that poem and people are reacting, so it's working. It's like, it's something. I mean, because laughter, um, you know, crying, all that are really um, honest feeling. It's like, you know, so uh, that's the only way uh, I understood that he did like a great job but because beside that, for me, it was impossible. Maybe I can ask people and all that, but when I when I saw the reaction of people, I was like, yes, he did it. I'm so happy. And it's, uh, it's a joy. It's like a celebration to, to have a translator. I mean, it's yeah. like, I mean, every point uh, had to be translated. It's, it's, I mean, the, to have the opportunity to... to uh, to communicate with a translator in that in that kind of way, you know that the people start like digging in your points and start like finding a new scene uh, underneath that point, you know, beyond that point is it, so great. I mean, it's so it's so interesting, and I and I think that's one of the per perfect uh, way of communication possible. Like. Yeah, there's a great comment that Borges said, that he said, uh, Borges said he never regretted not learning ancient Greek because he had so many versions of the Odyssey in the Iliad to read that it was a delight. He had Chapman's Iliad, he had Alexander Pope's, he had versions in Spanish. It was constantly this idea of rediscovering something through translation. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one last question because it's getting very late. Is oh, just sure, sure. Yeah, um, since I'm translating my own yeah. work, 
Uh, I did have, I mentioned it, I had uh, several people and I was actually surprised when it was uh, Latin American writers that were saying, you shouldn't be translating your own work because you're not familiar enough with the language. And, uh, but back to your question, uh, for me, sound always comes first. Of course, meaning, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know, but with my own work or others, uh, that is the very first thing that I feel like I have to come, you know, it's never gonna be the same, of course. It's always, it's it's gonna be a, another piece in, in it, you know, in and of itself. Um, but sound is always first and then meaning comes after. And I think that's how we get to, if, like you were saying, uh, you know, that a similar feeling, of course, never the same. Is one last question from the audience. Thank you for... I see that. Back. Uh, okay. Yeah, my question is just um, regarding, like, how you guys each treat audience. How do you guys feel about audience while you're writing? Um, I think also if you want to do an intersection with tonight, right? Like, how do we write for bilingual audiences? Or for, yeah, if, if you guys can all speak to how you feel about your audience while you write. Or how you don't. So how do you write for a bilingual audience? Is that is that the question? How do we feel about a bilingual audience? Yeah, if you'd like it to be the question, but just audience yeah, in yeah, general. Yeah. Audience. Um, okay, okay. Anybody like, wants to who are you writing for? Right. Ah, okay, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm busy. I'm writing for myself. Like, you know, and I'm thinking about myself. Like in 20 years, so I was gonna, what I'm gonna think about that poem. When I'm sitting there and thinking about that, um, I like to write poems to people, like letters, like address some people and all that. And when I'm um, writing those poems, I'm thinking about those specific persons, you know, but to think about uh, like uh, a reader or, not, or an audience is like, for me, it's, it's kind of hard. It's like a blur, like, like right now I can see you, man. Uh, it's, it's like, so I'm writing and in, I'm writing to the void, like, but I'm thinking about you and I'm hearing your voice and I know you're there, but I can't see you. So I think it's about that. It's about, uh, about writing, about, uh, that void about, and especially about that future. I'm thinking about uh, a Dominican, probably a Dominican girl or a kid, like in uh, 2122 or something like that, that's gonna read that point and it's gonna like get emotional or something like that. I'm thinking about that. And you know, that's, that's like dark, that's the void. I, I can I can see it. I don't know what she's gonna look like in that year. So yeah, I I hope to be writing for you. You know, the one who asked the question. Always, I'm writing for you. Um, in the back of my mind, there's always my mother. <laughs> I feel like I'm writing for her <laughs> all the time, and for Puerto Rico, even though I don't want to be a nationalistic, but it's like always there. I, I started writing poetry when I left the island, so it has always been an, an, an attempt to return or to not break up completely. So my audience, it, yeah, it's, it's Puerto Rican. Um, but right now, it's you. and. Uh, I've been living in San Diego for five years. Uh, only recently, because of the pandemic and everything, only recently I've been kind of reading in the community and, and uh, having to read in English mostly. Um, and it's been wonderful. I, I really, I can't uh, complain. And it's such a privilege to be able to read in both languages and to be understood by an, by an, by an audience in both languages. And I love when people, after a reading, say to me, oh, I love this poem, but I liked it more in Spanish, or I like this one more in English. You know, I love that. I love to get that <laughs> immediate feedback uh, from an uh, audience that can follow both. It's really a privilege. Um, I think for me, it's just natural uh, to 
because I am bilingual, because I think that's the experience. And, you know, I am constantly going between both languages, thinking and speaking in both, and reading and writing in both. And uh, so it's just, uh, just, it, you know, and and uh, I don't worry about whether it's going to come out in Spanish or English. I try to just go with it and then figure it out. All right. Um, I think uh, I more or less my experience is Frank's experience. Like I think that at first I write for myself, or I only write. I try like to decipher something, an aesthetic experience, an emotional moment. I don't know, a moment of joy or not. And that's when I write poetry and uh, I try to, I don't know, more or less preserve that through language. Um, then I do think about an audience, obviously, for example, today I had to 10 minutes to read uh, and I had to go through my book and I knew that my book had like three different registers. So I try to get a selection of poems that actually like had a good vibe, uh, they flowed very well, contrast each other. I mean, that that's a different thing. And also when I'm fixing a book, for example, when I'm fixing a book after having written for a long time, I do need to think about an audience like, okay, how could this make sense? Uh, what order should I give to these poems? Uh, should I assign different sections, titles, etc.? Um, so I think that, that those are like my two stages, especially because I think that I write in a compulsive way. I mean, I write a lot and it's only about, I don't know, after a few years after that I come back to this and I say like, okay, in this set of poems I might have something in common. And there are these other experiences as well, as Frank mentioned, where when I do write a poem to someone, for someone, my friends, my daughter, a person I'm in love with, and now I have an audience, but that's a private audience before actually thinking about publishing it or whatever. So that's what I would say. Um, uh, it, it's, I think our time is up. Um, it's been a wonderful evening. Uh, Ramon, do you know? <laughs> there are books for sale at the bookstore. Please join us, and thank you very much for coming.